We love using symbolism in the Bible. We say things like, Jesus is the door. Jesus is the light. He's the way. He's the bread of life. He's the living water. He's the good shepherd. He's the rock. He's a fortress. Things like that. But for some reason, when we get to the most symbolic book in the Bible, which is Revelation, we start taking things literally. As many of you know, we actually use a lot of symbolism in our own language. We also call them idioms. It's a form of a grammatical expression specific to a given language. Like for instance, in English, we say things like, that guy's heart is dark, which means they're evil. Or we say things like, aren't you a little ray of sunshine? Which means they're being grumpy and we're kind of mocking them. Or I have butterflies in my stomach. We know that's not literal butterflies, it's just a way of saying we're nervous. Or something like, I'm working 24 seven. Are they literally working 24 hours a day, seven days a week? No, he's just saying he's very busy. Or things like, that guy's a scumbag. Well, you're not gonna say, wait, he's a scumbag? I thought that guy was a human. No, we know it's figurative. We know what this language means. These phrases of symbolism are only really actually in our English language. Other languages have their own unique figures of speech. I'm not going to go into what they are. Anybody from a different language will be able to tell you some of their unique figures of speech. It's actually super interesting. But to be fair, when it comes to Revelation, nobody actually takes all of Revelation literally. Everyone chooses what they want to take literal, and what they want to take as symbolic. The question is, how do we decide when we should do that? This is where knowledge of the Old Testament comes into play. Just like if we were to look at the symbolism of a different language, knowledge of that language would need to come into play for us to understand what their symbolism means. So when we read the Bible, we need to figure out what the author means when they use certain words. We cannot assume what they mean, or we end up looking pretty foolish. For instance, a Spanish speaker would show their lack of knowledge for English if they started taking all our idioms as literal. And so, in the same way, we as Christians also show our lack of knowledge for how a Hebraic first century Jew talked when we start to take these things literally as well, when they would have never taken these things to be literal. As someone once said, we are reading someone else's mail. And these letters are a completely different language with different figures of speech, different symbols, and that mail is also from a completely different time period and a completely different culture than ours as well. So. When we read in Matthew 24, 30, for instance, it says, Then will appear in heaven the sign of the Son of Man, and then all the tribes of the earth will mourn, and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven. And unfortunately, when most Christians read this, they think Jesus is actually going to be riding on a literal cloud, like a surfboard, out of heaven. And they don't realize that Isaiah 19, 1 says, Behold, the Lord is riding on a swift cloud and comes to Egypt. Wait a minute. God rode on a cloud to come to Egypt? I thought nobody's ever seen God. How does this take place? How did this happen? Well, it's because the context of Isaiah 19 is not God coming on a cloud literally. It is that Egypt is going to be destroyed by a nether army not God or Jesus literally on the cloud judging them, but it is symbolic apocalyptic language to describe how God would use an opposing army to destroy Egypt. Not that they themselves literally were going to come and do it themselves. This is apocalyptic language. Another example I want us to look at is in Revelation 6, 12 through 14. It says, when he opened the sixth seal, I looked, and behold, there was a great earthquake, the sun became black as sackcloth, the moon became like blood, and the stars of the sky fell to the earth as the fig tree sheds its winter fruit when shaken by a gale. 
the sky vanished like a scroll that is being rolled up and every mountain and island was removed from its place. So I want us to use some common sense here. Is this literal? Are the stars literally going to hit the earth? Is every mountain and island literally going to disappear? I hope your answer is no. How do we know this? Well, many reasons, but one of the reasons is because in the very next verse, it says that after this massive destruction, kings, generals, rich people, poor people, slave, free, all these people are going to be hiding in caves. How are they going to be in caves and among the rocks of a mountain if the mountains were just removed? And how did the planet not get destroyed when a star hit it? This is clearly symbolic language and is the same language that is actually used in Isaiah 34 for when it says, all the hosts of heaven shall rot away and the skies roll up like a scroll and their host shall fall as leaves fall from the vine, like leaves falling from the fig tree. No scholar is ever going to say Isaiah 34 is about the literal end of the world. Why? Because Isaiah 34 is talking about a judgment on Edom. It is symbolic language that is used to emphasize a point, a very powerful point. So Revelation and Isaiah both use the exact same language that's also found in Matthew 24. If we look in Matthew 24, it says the same kind of stuff. The sun's darkened, the stars are falling, the heaven is shaken, the same events as the second coming. So a normal Christian is actually going to read this, and probably many of you watching that are futurists will read this and be very confused. Because in your mind, you're thinking, this is literal stuff that's going to happen when the end of the world takes place. But what's funny is even the best scholars won't actually take that approach. They'll look at this passage and say, this is symbolic here, this is symbolic here, all the way up until the Son of Man returning, it's all symbolic. But as soon as Jesus starts coming on the clouds and the angels coming and all the elect gathered, now this is literal. That's what a scholar will say. Well, where's the justification for that? All of this was just symbolic language. And even what they're saying is literal is also symbolic language. There's no justification for that view besides a bias. This is clearly symbolic language used in the Old Testament. It's never to be taken literally. And I also want us to note that when we talked about Revelation 6 and Isaiah 34, you know what was a key component of these two apocalyptic passages that also mirrored Matthew 24? Well, they both had a fig tree in them. And what does Jesus say to his disciples in verse 32? He says, from the fig tree, learn its lesson. He's also using a fig tree analogy. Just like Isaiah 34 used a fig tree, just like Revelation used a fig tree. And he's telling his disciples that they are going to see these things. Their generation will not end, which a generation is 40 years. Scholars even agree with that. A, their generation will not end until these things take place. Not any future generation. Jesus is saying, truly city, you. We can't pervert these the text like this to fit our bias. We have to take Jesus at his word and say where it's where it's meant to be literal, that's where it's little where, where it's meant to be symbolic, that's where it's symbolic. We can't be playing with the text like Christians have been for so long. But my point is we need to let the language inform us of how the author uses the words instead of us assuming what they mean. Otherwise, we are just like any foreigner speaking a native language and not understanding the symbolism. When we keep doing this as Christians, we are ultimately embarrassing the name of Jesus because we're butchering the text and we have been butchering the text for centuries. We don't need to keep doing this. We have the technology to be better, to do better research than any other scholar ever before. 
No one could ever do the type of research we can now as Christians. It's insane what we can do, what we can cross-reference, what we can look up, all the resources we have. We don't need to be stuck in this bad way of interpreting scripture and give an excuse of, oh, the early church believed this, so that's what we have to believe. We don't have to believe that. Early church was wrong dozens of times, hundreds of times. It's, it's a bad argument to even say that. We have to stick with what does the Bible say? What did the authors mean? And how did the first century Jews, how would they have taken this language? We need to accept the fact that Christ already came in 70 AD in judgment to destroy apostate Israel. That also began the everlasting spiritual new covenant kingdom that also vindicated all the martyrs that were killed by apostate Israel throughout the centuries. And it also brought in everlasting righteousness and allowed us to go immediately to heaven to be with our savior when we die in heaven when we die. Not a new recreated earth, which by the way, is also symbolic language used to describe the new covenant. That's why Isaiah 65 has people dying in the New Covenant, people giving birth in the New Covenant, salvation still happening in the New Covenant Kingdom. This is not a literal New Heaven and New Earth, it's symbolic. Our goal is to be in heaven, in the presence of God. And when we go there, we will be with our Savior in heaven forever. And that's a great thing, right? Hallelujah. I really hope you guys found this helpful and hopeful encouraging and also challenging if you are new. I encourage you to continue to do research on this. Don't just take my word for it. Look at the text yourself. If you found this video helpful, make sure to like and subscribe for more. And make sure to check out any of the other videos I have as well. Thanks for watching. God bless.